In today's brief, we'll talk about Prigozhin's return, torture at the ZNPP, and a narrative shift in the Russian info space. I'm Linnea, and today is Monday, July 31st, 2023. You're listening to the Ukraine War Brief podcast, where we bring you up to speed on the war in Ukraine in about 20 minutes or less. Let's get started with the news in Ukraine from the front. While fighting is still intense across the front, it appears to be resulting in less catastrophic personnel losses for Russia than last week, with the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, reporting that Russia lost 390 troops on July 28th, one tank, six armored personnel carriers, or APCs, 11 artillery systems, and eight other vehicles. The GSAFU reported that on the 29th, Ukrainian forces killed 480 Russian troops and destroyed 14 tanks and 11 other vehicles, including an anti-aircraft missile system, eight artillery firing positions, two electronic warfare stations, and four reconnaissance drones. Russian losses were pretty similar on the 30th, with 490 troops reported, quote, liquidated, though with an incredible 21 artillery systems destroyed. July 29th was the day of Special Operations Forces of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky marked the occasion with an unannounced visit to the front near Bakhmut to meet with Special Forces soldiers. The Institute for the Study of War, or ISW, reported that Ukrainian forces advanced near the city of Bakhmut, with Ukrainian officials saying the counteroffensive is pressing ahead on both the northern and southern flanks, and Ukraine continues to hold the initiative. In the Liman direction, Russian forces attempted to advance near Novoyehorivka and Bilohorivka in Luhansk Oblast and were unsuccessful. Russian advances were also reportedly repelled in the Avdeevka, Marinka, and Shakhtarsk directions in Donetsk Oblast. In the Zaporizhia direction, the GSAFU reported that Russian forces were focused on preventing further Ukrainian advances near Staromayorske and attacked the town of Orekhiv with KAB-guided bombs on July 29th. A five-story residential building and houses were damaged in the attack, but no casualties had been reported at the time of recording. Ukraine has advanced roughly 17 kilometers southeast from Orekhiv to southeast of Robotyne. Videos show Ukrainian armored vehicles reaching the first line of defense in the so-called Sirovikin lines a vast network of trenches, anti-tank dragon's teeth, and minefields. In Zaporizhia, the Sorovikin lines are up to 20 kilometers in depth. A NATO military would never attempt to cross these lines without first establishing air superiority, and even then, successfully crossing these obstacles is extremely complex. Unfortunately, the learning curve will be steep. A video emerged from east of Robotene showing at least seven Ukrainian BMP-1s, that's a type of armored personnel carrier, being ambushed and destroyed. The video did also show that Russia is likely starved for artillery and manpower. Despite the losses, the AFU made tactical gains across the minefield and to the first trench of the Sarovikin line. And according to an unnamed U.S. official cited in the Washington Post, Ukraine still has 10 brigades that have not yet been deployed. Moving on to the home front, Russian forces attacked the center of the city of Dnipro on July 28, according to Dnipropetrovsk Oblast Governor Serhii Lusak, damaging an unfinished apartment building and an unoccupied Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, building. UNESCO representatives arrived in Odessa on the 29th to assess and document the damage caused to cultural and religious buildings by Russian missile attacks over the past two weeks. The Odessa City Council notes that about 50 points of interest have been damaged, so it will be an extensive process. Regional officials reported that 14 people were injured on July 28 in Russian attacks on Donetsk, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Cherniv, Dnipropetrovsk, Kherson, Luhansk, Mykolaiv, and Sume oblasts. On July 29th, a Russian missile struck the city of Zaporizhia, killing two people and injuring another. Agricultural enterprises in Kherson oblast and Kriviri in Dnipropetrovsk oblast were targeted by Russian Shahed 136 Kamikaze drones overnight on July 29th and 30th, 
with all four drones reportedly destroyed and no known casualties. Two people were killed and 20 injured in a missile strike on a vocational school in Sumy in northeastern Ukraine. At the time of recording, three people remained hospitalized. Building up Ukraine's air defense capabilities now will be less expensive than rebuilding battered civilian areas later, according to Ukrainian presidential advisor Mikhailo Podolyak, who stated that 10 more Patriot missile systems would be needed for a total of 12 in order to sufficiently defend Ukraine's major cities from missile strikes. President Zelensky visited soldiers undergoing treatment at a rehabilitation center in Ivano-Frankivsk, saying, quote, I want to thank each of our soldiers for their feats of heroism. Thank you from all Ukrainians for defending our country. We will definitely win. I wish you all a speedy recovery. End quote. In today's In Memoriam segment, we'd like to recognize the sacrifice of Andriy Khalak, callsign Hulk. He was the friend of a friend, and Yulia interviewed him only two weeks prior to his death. To tell you a little bit about Andriy, At 18 years old, Andriy stood in defense of Ukrainian people by actively participating in the Revolution of Dignity, helping taking injured people away from the palace. In fact, on February 20th, 2014, he suffered a bullet wound in his shoulder. On February 24th, at the beginning of the full-scale war, Andriy became one of the first volunteers, and by February 27th was already in the ranks of the AFU. With a more-than-human endurance, Andriy and his brothers-in-arms held positions in the front, taking part in the liberation of settlements in Kherson and Mykolaiv directions, including combat tasks in Blachodatne, which was, at the time, encircled by Russian forces. Thanks in part to his actions, the Russian offensive was unsuccessful, and for that he was awarded the Order of Courage and was recognized by the Minister of Defense. On November 30, 2022, Andriy was part of a unit that was engaged in a tactical combat task, and in sacrificing himself, he saved the lives of his six brothers-in-arms. There is currently a petition circulating to grant him the title of Hero of Ukraine. If you are a Ukrainian citizen, please consider signing the petition. You'll find the link in the description. If you're enjoying the episode, please rate us and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email at social at borlingen.media. That's B-O-R-L-I-N-G-O-N dot media. Let's move on to the temporarily occupied territories. Serhii Potanim, a labor protection engineer of the Central Technical and Administrative Department of the Temporarily Occupied Zaporizhia Nuclear Power Plant, or ZNPP, was taken into Russian captivity on June 23rd and has reportedly been repeatedly subjected to torture and physical violence and then taken to the hospital to prevent him from dying. According to Enerkhoatum, Ukraine's state-run energy agency, no reason has been given for Potnim's arrest, nor have any charges been brought against him. The heavily fortified city of Tokmak in occupied Zaporizhia, a key logistics hub for Russia due to railway and highway junctions, was struck by HIMARS on July 27th, with video of secondary explosions indicating Ukrainian forces had hit an ammunition depot. Russian propagandists reported that there was a missile attack on the building of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic in occupied Donetsk on July 27. Also, an oil depot in the city was hit by HIMARS or a loitering munition on July 28, and an ammunition depot was struck on July 29. Russian ammunition storage in Cossack Bay in Sevastopol, that's in occupied Crimea, exploded late on the 28th, with reports of secondary explosions. According to Ukrainian intelligence, Russia's 810th Guards Naval Infantry Brigade is currently stationed in Cossack Bay. Vladimir Saldo, Russian-appointed governor of occupied Kherson and the stolen raccoon's arch-nemesis, said that Ukrainian forces attempted to destroy the railway between Henechesk in occupied Kherson and Jankoy in occupied Crimea with 12 Storm Shadow missiles, all of which were, according to occupation authorities, shot down with only minimal damage caused by missile debris. The Russian Ministry of Defense, or MOD, later reported, however, that seven Storm Shadow missiles had been shot down, and the Ukrainian armed forces reported they had been successful in striking the Chonkhar Bridge. 
Russian media reported that traffic was backed up in front of the bridge, and vehicles were directed to a detour through Armyansk, saying that the bridge won't be operable in the near future. Both the railway and highway portions of the bridge were reportedly destroyed. Speaking of poorly coordinated, let's talk about the Russian Federation and Belarus. A photo emerged on social media of private military company or PMC Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin cosplaying as a regular guy in a polo shirt tucked into jeans, shaking hands with an official from the Central African Republic in a gaudy hotel during the Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg. The ISW wrote that Prigozhin's presence at the forum and engagement with African leaders was likely an effort to position Wagner Group as an alternative to Western partners, wanting to maintain significant involvement on the continent amid lucrative military and mining contracts. In case you're new to this circus, Prigozhin is currently under investigation for treason in Russia after committing an almost coup and occupying a few Russian oblasts for the weekend back in late June. The Russian Foreign Ministry said in a statement during the summit that Russia is fighting in Ukraine, quote, for the freedom of Africa, end quote. I'm sorry, what? The ISW noted that Russian mill bloggers have more enthusiastically spread Kremlin narratives recently about the supposedly failed Ukrainian counteroffensive. And the so-called ultranationalist information space appears to be uniting behind the Kremlin's messaging. ISW analysts assess the shift is at least partially due to fears of a Kremlin crackdown in the Russian info space following the arrest of prominent pro-war critic, former FSB officer and genocidal war criminal Igor Girkin. Russian news agency TASS reported an explosion at a 50-story building in Moscow, supposedly carried out by Ukrainian drones. According to Russian telegram channel The Insider, the building that was damaged was the IQ Quarter Building and housed the offices of multiple Russian ministries, like the Ministry of Economic Development, the Ministry of Industry and Trade, the Ministry of Digital Development, and the Federal Agency for Ethnic Affairs. The Russian MOD alleged the drones, quote, did not hit their intended targets, end quote, but it sounds like they were pretty effective regardless. Let's talk about the news worldwide. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. believes Russia is attempting to get weapons from North Korea following a visit to the isolated dictatorship by Russian Minister of Defense and pretend general Sergei Shoigu. Secretary Blinken said on July 29th, quote, We're seeing Russia desperately looking for support, for weapons, wherever it can find them to continue to prosecute its aggression against Ukraine. End quote. A little background for the next news piece. In the United States, spending bills have to originate in the House, then pass through the Senate, then be negotiated between the two chambers, and then finally sent to the President for signature. Two weeks ago, the House allocated $874 billion for the National Defense Authorization Act, which sets the defense budget. The U.S. Senate passed its version of the bill on July 28th, allocating $886 billion in defense spending. Both bills are above the $842 billion requested by the White House and $126 billion above the budget in fiscal year 2022. Both versions of the bill allocate $300 million for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, a long-term funding mechanism, and extend it until 2027. The special representative to Ukraine said the White House would request $60 billion in fiscal year 2024 as a standalone bill for security assistance to Ukraine. A recent opinion poll showed an increase in U.S. support for Ukraine, with 78% of Americans stating they believe Ukraine must win the war, including 71% of Republicans. The far and away favorite for the Republican nomination for president in 2024, twice impeached and thrice indicted former President Donald Trump, continues to say he'd request that Europe pay back all of the money sent to Ukraine. Saudi Arabia is reportedly set to host peace talks among Western countries with the aim of ending the war in Ukraine, scheduled to take place on August 5th and 6th with representatives from 30 countries expected to attend. Andriy Yermak, head of the office of the president of Ukraine, 
said that Ukraine will begin negotiations with the United States on a bilateral agreement on providing security guarantees within the framework of the Joint Declaration of Support of Ukraine, which will be valid until Ukraine joins NATO. Let's talk military tech. German arms manufacturer Rheinmetall will start repairing Leopard tanks and other military equipment in Ukraine in the next few weeks, as the need for repairs is likely to increase as the counteroffensive heats up. Ukraine's new maritime drone debuted on CNN over the weekend. Its developers touted its ability to carry up to 300 kilograms of explosives and cover a distance of up to 800 kilometers at a maximum speed of 77 kilometers per hour. The drone is designed for surveillance, reconnaissance, patrolling, search and rescue, mine countermeasures, fleet protection, and even combat missions. Starlink CEO and Ultimate Bro Elon Musk has a habit of throttling or disconnecting access to some Starlink terminals in Ukraine, so the Pentagon has made a plan to buy Starlink terminals that Musk won't be able to turn off. That's the brief for today. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And please consider supporting our written work on Substack. You'll find the links in the description. We'll be back tomorrow with more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone.